Welcome to the Animal Training Fundamentals Podcast, where we have fun with practical application and we get mental with the science of behavior. Put them both together and you get results, solutions for your behavior problems, and the tools you need to achieve your training goals. I'm your host, Barbara Heidenreich. Let's talk training. Hey, animal people. It's Barbara. I'm here with Annetta Peterson from the Copenhagen Zoo. She's the animal training coordinator there. And she also is the uh, chairperson for the animal training working group for the European Association of Zoos and Aquariums. She's also helping to organize the conference that's going to be over in Europe for the Animal Behavior Management Alliance group. So welcome, Annetta Peterson. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> now, we're going to talk about something today that I think is really important for everyone to listen to. This is what I like to call the unthinkable. When the unthinkable happens, what happens when a guest does something that you just didn't expect and it leads to a situation where a guest is in danger and potentially an animal is in danger? Over at Copenhagen Zoo, they had a very unfortunate incident where a guest actually crawled into an enclosure with the polar bear. Mm. And I'm going to let Anetta take over because she knows more about what happened because you were actually there, weren't you, Anetta? Yes, I was. That's one of my most creepy moments in my 30 years at the zoo. I still remember it because it was at lunchtime. Everybody was in the cantina having lunch. People were talking and yeah, there was keepers, uh, managers, service personnel, administration people, all people, people come at the same time for lunch. And suddenly we got a, um, a call on the radio from one of our security guys. We've been doing a lot of drills, you know, people in exhibits and what does it mean to do a drill? Because a, a lot of people don't know that zoos actually prepare for an incident like this. Yes, and, uh, and we do a lot. I mean, we really prepare. We uh, educate people to use guns, which sounds crazy, but it's pump guns. We go to a shooting area and we have different kind of bullets that we teach people to use, like plastic bullets, rubber bullets. It's actually from uh, the US and there are law enforcement bullets, which they, the police in the US use on demonstrations and other things when they want to spread people and let, get people away from areas. So they're used on people. So it's not like killing bullets. And then we can upgrade to uh, bigger and, and more deadly bullets people may not be aware of is every single person in the zoo understands their role and their job when a situation like that happens, right? Yes. So we have groups of shooters. We have groups that knows to get people away. There are groups that goes around in the zoo and make sure people get inside houses or evacuate houses. So, you know, if emergency call comes, everybody knows their job. You know, you prepare for something year after year after year, knowing that this is not ever going to happen. And then suddenly one day it happens. And that was the most creepy moment I remember. So you're so in we the were, cantina and you get the yeah, call, right? We got the call. And this um, security guy, he said, listen, this is not a drill. We have a person in the polar bear exhibit. And Everybody was quiet and exactly the same time all chairs was pushed back and everybody got up at exactly the same time. And people just went out to do exactly what they knew they were supposed to do. I have to say that the polar bear exhibit is on the other end of the zoo compared to the cantina where everybody was. And from the moment we got the call till everybody was on their spot getting people away securing areas, getting the shooters ready, getting the, peep, uh, the keepers up at the back areas and everybody in place. It took 90 seconds. 90 seconds. Oh my God. 90 seconds. Wow. That was crazy. Our veterinarian who is in charge of the whole operation, he took time from the radio call until he got up to the polar bear exhibit, was ready to do whatever they had to do. That is why you practice, right? Exactly. Yeah. To be as fast as possible. I, yeah. That was pretty amazing. I was up there next to a shooter helping loading a gun because we have to load the bullets in a specific order. 
because we keep adding up, you know, if the situation gets more and more critical, at some point we will have to shoot the bear. Like, yeah, like Cincinnati Zoo, they had to shoot the gorilla and that's really awful. I mean, but you cannot let them eat people. So you have to try to save people. Yeah. And um, I remember coming up there and I don't know if you can imagine watching a person kneel in front of a 600 kilo polar bear male and you are so prepared on what you're going to see mm. and the bear just sniffed him fortunately it was win- winter time and the polar bears are pretty lazy at winter times they're not really hungry they don't really want to do anything so he was pretty lucky i think and before we got up there, the polar bear had done his, um, you know, the push things, the jump on things to break things. And he, he had a couple of broken ribs, I think. And after that, he just kneeled in front of the bear. The bear sniffed him and kind of turned around. And all the keepers and all the zoo pe- personnel keep, kept shouting to this guy, get away, get into the mold. There was a mold next to him. The polar bear could get down there, but there was some cliffs and stuff where he could try and hide. I mean, so the shooters would get a free access to shoot uh, rubber bullets at the bear. I remember it took ages. I, th- I think it took minutes before he reacted. And, and we, we realized that he wasn't Danish, so we tried in English. At some point, he got up and he went down in the mold. He hide himself down there under some cliffs. The shooters shot rubber bullets at the bear and of course it didn't like that and fortunately it went to the back area and the gate was shut and the guy survived amazing yeah yeah Yeah. wow i assume that people were trying to call the bear back as well but the bear was just so Hmm. engaged with this novel experience i'm sure of a person being in its Hmm. with them that at that time wasn't too responsive to people calling? Is that is that the situation? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And also because they were in this lazy mood, he was not reacting fast to any any thing at all, even the guy in the exhibit. So okay. it was hard to, to make him react to anything. Wow. Intense. I just remember being so furious because I knew we had to kill the bear and it was such a wonderful bear. And, and I thought such an yeah. jerk to go in there and... and have us doing these things right so i was really happy that the bear survived and of course the person too yeah well and i'm sure people want to know um was it there ever any um answer as to why the person went in there did it did anyone ever find out what was wrong or why somebody would do that yes because um we spoke with some uh school kids that had been standing next to the polar bear exhibit. And they talked about how soft and nice he must be to touch. And of course, this this guy, he was mentally ill. And he listened to this and he thought, well, I'm going to pet the bear. So how he got in there, I still don't understand. I've been standing out there staring. They said he walked on some lamps that was on the wall, but I couldn't find them. So I don't know exactly how he got in there. Oh, like um, how he could climb into the moat and then up the wall to where the bear was, you mean? Yeah, yeah because it's it's actually, as I see it, not possible. Mm. I mean, he would have to fall down uh, five meters mold to mm. to get over to the bear. I don't know. And do we know whatever happened to that person after afterwards? Uh, yeah, he got to the hospital and he got, of course, a lot of medical care and... Uh, of course, psychological help. So now the important question, what about what about your bear? What's happened with your bear since then? Yeah, actually, we don't have the bear anymore, but that's something totally different. Ah, okay. <laughs> that's from breeding uh, reasons. But what have, happened to him afterwards, I would love to say that we had trained emergency recalls, but we haven't. It's kind of a big job to, to train emergency recalls. And, you know, you have a lot of, preferences in training you, you know, there's so many things that would be wonderful to do and and i mean yeah we experienced it and and it's necessary i think the optimal would be to train it with all dangerous animals carnivores because we also had a guy in with the tigers but that was after closing time and he did not survive so they, so it happens and how, how did it affect your keepers and your staff after that 
How did how did they respond to that incident? We immediately the same day, actually, at almost the same time as the guy was moved from from the exhibit um, to the hospital, we uh, we called in a lot of psychologists uh, to take care of both the personnel, but also the guests that had seen it. People were sh- in shock. Uh, some people reacted more than others. To get hold of everybody and make sure that everybody got, you know, uh, psychological help because it can affect people on, on long terms. It's really worse than than you think it is. I mean, it's it's really bad because you see all kinds of things even before it happens. Yeah, I think I would imagine the you know not knowing what's about to happen and anticipating mm-hmm. what might happen that that anxiety that would be associated with that could be extremely. Yeah. Yeah, and there were schools in there, and kids. And having been in this situation, do you have any advice for other zoo professionals? Mm, I think that emergency uh, drills are extremely important. I mean, yeah, I know exactly what everybody should do, and and also try to see if it's possible to use the methods that could still make the animal stay alive. Like we use the rubber bullets. We have plastic bullets, rubber bullets, small steel bullets and so on. So we can upgrade all the time, but, um, but still we, he had a chance with the rubber bullets and we were lucky that he reacted to that. And also making sure that everybody knows what they have to do. I mean, even though it may seem like a waste of time to, to make all these drills and, uh, Make sure everybody's educated and, and trained to do what they have to do on a day like that. It's all worth it. Yeah, I know. And as you mentioned, we, you know, we talk about emergency recalls, but the reality is all the quadrants are tools for us. So even though we would love animals to do things because of positive reinforcement, mm-hmm. sometimes we can't train for every novel experience that the animal is going to encounter. And mm. we do train for emergency recalls. Obviously, we try to generalize the distractions so that eventually every tempting distraction that falls into the enclosure, mm. they'll learn to ignore. But there may come that situation where it's so exciting and interesting that they're not willing to leave mm. that distraction to go into the back for something reinforcing. And as you said, since it was wintertime, maybe the food reinforcers that you generally would offer or the exciting thing that you would typically mm. offer for emergency recall was wouldn't be reinforcing enough. So we do have to consider an aversive, again, using those other quadrants to influence behavior when it comes down to a life or death situation. So sometimes mm. we're using those other quadrants to get behavior. Yeah. I would doubt very much that um, an emergency recall would have worked at that time because he was not food motivated. Actually, he wasn't really motivated for anything. And that was one of the reasons why this guy survived, I'm sure, because he wasn't even motivated for novel things like humans. (laughs) Yeah. So, yeah. And that was lucky. Yeah. But also I think that talking about emergency recalls, I see a lot of uh, recalls that are claimed to be emergency recalls, but real emergency recalls is a lot of work because, as you say, you have to to use tons of new, interesting distractions and you have to train for the animals to, to, to leave it, to go inside. And I think one of the hardest things are living things that moves and smells good and mostly carnivores that you want to do this with. And I mean, just try to throw in something that smells like humans and move a little. That would be hard stuff. I don't know if it actually ever succeeded. I'm, I don't know. I, I've seen a lot of attempts and, and I think it's really good to keep trying. And, and I know we will at some point because we talked a lot about it. It's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. I agree. Um, and, mm. and definitely, I mean, it's certainly worth, worth working on. Uh, you know, I, I agree with you there, but you're right. It's different from just a regular recall and we get yeah, animals re- that, that call great on recall at the end mm. of the day, you know, every day kind of thing like that. But definitely it's a different behavior than an emergency recall. Yeah, of course. A recall is interesting because it's everything else is like what it used to be, you know, a recall that could predict something interesting, something new. Of course, they react to that compared to emergency recalls. That's really easy. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. Yeah. I think I think we're going to have to do another um, discussion on that because you've got some great recalls trained at your zoo. A famous one is those yeah. those rabbits. So we'll have to yeah, we'll, have, we'll have to do another discussion on that because that one's going to be a fun one to talk about some more. I yeah. think. <laughs> I think so too.
I have another question for you. So what behaviors are your polar bears learning now and what goals do you have for them that have nothing to do with recall, some, some other behaviors that your polar bears have learned to do? Yeah, we have been wanting to do blood draws on polar bears, but actually our veterinarians, they just, one of our veterinarians said that, well, it's not really so necessary to take blood from a polar bear because they're never sick. <laughs> they never get any diseases for some reason, but they often break their teeth. So mouth checks are really important, and we do that with the polar bears. We do some ear checks and body checkups and, and paw checkups. Yeah, you want to do a lot of things, but also you always have to prioritize because you have so many people and so many animals and so many things you want to train. So I think that it could be nice, but you have to choose between need to have and nice to have. <laughs> so what are some things that people might not know about polar bears? Like what are their preferred reinforcers? I think most of them like pig fat. Mm -hmm. Lard, fat I, I think people call it lard sometimes. Yeah, yeah. and uh, a fish oil. Recently, I just heard that one of the things they really like is mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I haven't tried no. that one yet. No, and the first remark on that was, I wonder how people came up with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I've heard that, so we're going to try that. But uh, besides that, we use uh, fish and, uh, and meat, of course. Mm -hmm. But I think that the fish oil, they really like that. Ah, okay. And yeah. do you uh, have any particular ways that you're delivering those items to be safe? Any challenges that people should know about that might be thinking about working with polar bears or work with polar bears? Yeah, I think the fish oil is pretty easy. It's from big syringes, do you call it that, without the needle on, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so we just, you know, pump it up and flush it in their mouth. They're very good at opening their mouth when you <laughs> put it in. Otherwise, I would recommend you use some kind of tongue or um, chopstick or something to to put into the to the meat to uh, to feed the polar bear. I know people underestimate sometimes the the speed and the and the ability of some of these animals just cuz like you're saying like the guy thought, you know, they look soft, I just want to pet them. <laughs> yeah, and they can look so slow, but they can just explode. Yeah. It's crazy how fast they are. Well, anything else you would like to share with us about polar bears today, Anetta? No, I think polar bears are a little special compared to other bears, at least to brown bears cuz those are the other kind of bears we have. It's like the polar bears have tons of time. Not that they have a big latency when you work with them, but it's like, I don't know, it's like they're prepared to wait a long time. And, and I was wondering about that, but it really matched their natural behavior very, very well. I mean, when they want to wait for a seal at the breathing holes in the ice, they can sit there for days waiting for that seal. So maybe that's the reason why they are so patient. They seem so patient, I think. You know, brown bears could be like, oh, give me the food, give me food, give me food. But polar bears are much more calm and that's how I've seen the ones we have had anyway. Yeah. It makes, makes you think about, uh, and once again, you always have to go back to the natural history of the species and know your species that you're training. I mean, the young bears can be pretty eager and, you know, impatient, but compared to the the older one, I th yeah, I think there is some kind of patience with, with the, maybe it's just the ones we have. I don't know. I'm not a specialist on polar bear, but, but I always wondered about this patience they have. Love it. Love it. Well, I'm definitely going to uh, explore that a little bit more now. I'm going to have to keep my eye open anytime I get an opportunity to work with polar bear and ask those, those people working with those animals a few more questions and see what they observe and what they notice on a regular basis. Good. Yeah, me too. I want to know if I'm right. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, cool. Well, thank you for sharing that story because I, I know it's a tough one to talk about, but I think there's some good mm. information for people to glean from that to help them yeah. be prepared mm. Uh, mm. for something at their facility. So uh, just before we leave, is there anything that you would like to share with us about any cool events coming up that you're participating in or that you would like people to know about? If people aren't aware, Annetta is a great teacher. Um, I'm, I've been lucky enough to be around her when she's sharing information with other trainers. And, and I know she's got some cool events coming up. Yes, tons. <laughs> <laughs> we have um, the ASA annual, annual uh, conference in Valencia. We have a workshop there. 
you should know about that because you're teaching it too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we have uh, Kirsten Andersen Hansen from, uh, from Denmark, who is a researcher for hearing in marine mammals and uh, marine birds. Very interesting. We're doing a short pre-conference workshop in Valencia on the 17th of September. In the autumn, in October, we have IASA Academy has a training, a training course, a one week, or it's four day training course taught by me and Kirsten. And maybe Tim Mackey is going to uh, join us. We don't know for sure yet, but we hope so. We cross our fingers. And then if we go to the spring, I know that the IASA Welfare Group is preparing a big welfare forum and it's going to be in Appen Hall in Holland. Uh, and it's a three-day conference on welfare. And just after that, just two days later, it's also in Holland. So you can just make a week in Holland and you can get two conferences. Is that cool? And the other conference is the Animal Behavior Management Alliance Conference. And that is in Bexebergen in, in Holland, a little south of the other conference. There is tons to do in stuff. Europe if you're yes. into animal training. Absolutely. All yes. right. I can't go to all of them, but I'm definitely coming to at least two of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're so welcome. <laughs> Yay. All right. Thanks again, Annetta, for sharing all your wonderful stories. And we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Okay, you too. <laughs> Bye. Bye. I'm very grateful to Annetta for sharing such a difficult experience with us. We expect guests of facilities to behave a certain way around animals, but the truth is that also means we trust visitors are well, have the mental capacity to follow the rules, and that they respect the safety parameters that are in place and they choose to abide by our policy. But for the sake of our human and animal safety, we know that's not enough. Annetta's story provides some important key takeaways. Number one, Prepare, prepare, prepare. Even though you hope that day will never come, you need to have a plan. Make sure everyone knows their job. So if the situation arises, everybody just runs on autopilot. 90 seconds response time, that was just amazing. Number two, have different levels to your emergency response plan. I love the idea of starting with rubber bullets and then plastic bullets before escalating to life-threatening strategies. It gives you an opportunity to save that animal's life. Number three, emergency recall is a great idea to train, but remember, it's different from a regular recall, and you really need to include some pretty heavy-duty tempting distractions. Your goal is that that animal will leave a moving, smelly, live distraction. Can you work up to that level of distraction? It may take a lot of work, so be prepared to consider an aversive to get the animal to move away from the person if it's a matter of losing human life or potentially the life of your animal. All right, guys, that was a heavy one, but I hope you found it informative. If you want to deep dive more into the world of animal training and behavior, you can get all access to my online education program for 10 days for just $1. Visit AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com, choose a membership option, and enter the code TRY10DAYS. If you liked what you heard today, visit AnimalTrainingFundamentals.com for more quality content on animal training. You'll find courses, community, and extensive video examples from my consulting work around the world. We'd love to have you join our force-free family. <laughs>